Welcome to the Centre for Anaesthesia student podcast series. In this podcast, we're going to be discussing the management of airway obstruction. Recognising airway compromise is a fundamental skill for junior doctors, as they will frequently be the first port of call in managing and assessing these patients. By appreciating the causes of an obstructed airway, treatment with oxygen and a number of simple manoeuvres can be delivered swiftly, preserving airway patency and passage of oxygen to the lungs for ventilation. Ventilation is the mechanical movement of air into and out of the respiratory system, resulting in the exchange of carbon dioxide. Airway obstruction results in hypoventilation, increased work of breathing and impaired gas exchange, with development of hypercarbia and ultimately hypoxemia if left untreated. Provision of supplemental oxygen in the setting of airway obstruction, i.e. oxygenation, will not resolve the problem of hypercapnia associated with hypoventilation and impaired alveolar ventilation. Reduced alveolar ventilation in the obstructed airway leads to hypercapnia, respiratory acidosis and hypoxemia. Causes of an obstructed airway The airway may be divided into the upper and lower airway. The upper airway comprises the passage from the nostrils and lips to the larynx, whilst the lower airway comprises the tracheobronchial tree. The level of obstruction will commonly be related to the cause or pathogenesis of a disease process. There are a large number of causes of airway obstruction, and it is helpful to classify these by the mode of obstruction. So, firstly, intraluminal contents. Examples would include blood, vomit and foreign bodies. Secondly, an obtunded central drive may be caused by head injury or drugs such as benzodiazepines, opiates and alcohol. Thirdly, external compression caused by hematoma, tumour or goiter. Fourthly, direct trauma including blunt trauma to the maxilla, larynx, mandible or burns and smoke inhalation which will contribute to airway edema and a rapidly threatened airway. In addition, artificial airways such as tracheostomies and stents which can become blocked or displaced can contribute to airway obstruction and compromise. And patients with neurocognitive and neuromuscular disorders, particularly those with a bulbar palsy, will also have an increased risk of aspiration. The commonest site for obstruction in the obtunded and unconscious patient is at the pharynx because the tongue falls back against the posterior pharyngeal wall and a lack of muscle tone causes narrowing of the airway diameter. So, how do we recognise the signs and symptoms of airway obstruction? It's important to assess airway patency in any patient at risk of airway obstruction. This forms part of the ABC approach used in life support algorithms. A conscious and alert patient speaking in full sentences is reassuring. Features suggestive of an obstructed airway include complete absence of airway sounds, complete airway obstruction, or added sounds of laboured breathing where air entry is diminished. Stridor is the harsh, high-pitched sound occurring in upper airway obstruction. Children are more susceptible to stridor given the relatively smaller diameter of their airways. Irritability, agitation and reduced conscious level commonly reflect hypoxemia and hypercarbia. Do not rely on cyanosis as a feature in identifying the obstructed airway. This is a very late pre-terminal sign. Low pulse oximetry readings reflect inadequacy of oxygenation although it is important to remember that pulse oximetry provides a measure of oxygenation and is not the same as ventilation. Arterial blood gas sampling can be helpful but should not delay management. A respiratory acidosis with a high carbon dioxide tension and reduced pH reflects alveolar hypoventilation. When assessing patients, look carefully for these signs and symptoms and always call for help early from an anaesthetist if you suspect airway compromise. Now on to managing a compromised airway. Oxygen therapy is required urgently in the obstructed airway. Give oxygen via a non-rebreathe reservoir bag and a flow rate of 15 litres per minute 
to provide a high inspired fraction of oxygen to the patient. Patients with an artificial airway, such as a tracheostomy, with features of respiratory distress, require urgent and skilled airway help. Do not delay in summon summoning immediate assistance from an anaesthetist. These devices may have become blocked or displaced. Apply high flow oxygen to both the face and the tracheostomy whilst waiting for expert help. A number of simple manoeuvres can be used in the obtunded patient to help improve the patency of the airway. These include the chin lift and the jaw thrust. Practice these on a mannequin or in theatre with an anaesthetist. The head tilt and chin lift is achieved by placing fingertips underneath the patient's chin and gently lifting upwards. The jaw thrust is achieved by combined flexion of the neck and extension at the atlanto-occipital joint, lifting the angles of the mandible forward. This manoeuvre lifts the tongue and moves the larynx forward. Some cautionary points. Avoid neck extension and risks to the spinal cord in patients in whom you suspect a cervical spine injury. In these patients, a jaw thrust in combination with manual inline stabilisation is recommended. Be mindful when practising the technique of jaw thrust in children in whom upward pressure on the soft tissues of the floor of the mouth can cause obstruction. Adjuncts including the oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airway may improve the patency of the airway in combination with the simple manoeuvres described. The oropharyngeal airway or Goodell airway relieves backward tongue displacement and soft palate obstruction. Size this airway by measuring the distance from the incisors to the angle of the jaw. The most common technique for placing an oropharyngeal airway is by inserting the airway into the mouth upside down and then rotating through 180 degrees at the junction between the hard and the soft palate. Conscious patients in whom laryngeal reflexes are present will not tolerate an oropharyngeal airway and inserting one may precipitate gagging, vomiting and laryngospasm. A nasopharyngeal airway may be a useful alternative in this group, though should be avoided in patients in whom a base of skull fracture or a coagulopathy is suspected. Bag valve mask ventilation. Patients with a reduced conscious level and inadequate spontaneous ventilation will require artificial ventilation in addition to the manoeuvres described. Connect a bag valve mask apparatus ambu bag to a high flow oxygen source. The technique requires two people to achieve a gas tight seal between the patient's face and the mask, enabling ventilation without leak. One person should hold the mask onto the face, maintaining a jaw thrust while the assistant squeezes the bag. The laryngeal mask airway. Should bag valve mask ventilation prove difficult, an alternative means of ventilation are needed. In these instances, summon senior support early. The laryngeal mask airway is a device for supporting and maintaining the airway without tracheal intubation. It does not protect the airway from soiling, unlike tracheal intubation, and is not a secure airway. However, it may serve as an interim measure in the unconscious patient when intubation has failed or a lack of skill and experience precludes intubation. The head of the laryngeal mask is inserted into the mouth and sits in the patient's hypopharynx. A circumferential cuff is then inflated to provide an adequate seal to enable ventilation. The end can then be connected to an ambibag device to provide artificial ventilation. Incorrect placement increases the risk of aspiration of stomach contents as the stomach may become gas filled during ventilation. As discussed earlier, the laryngeal mask does not guarantee protection from aspiration of gastric contents into the bronchial tree and will not be tolerated in patients in whom laryngeal reflexes are preserved. Again, try to familiarise yourself with the insertion technique with practice on a mannequin or under the supervision of an anaesthetist. Now on to securing an airway. A secure airway is one in which the trachea and bronchial tree are protected from aspiration of gastric contents or secretions by the presence of a cuffed endotracheal tube. 
This is the gold standard for an unconscious patient at risk of aspiration and should only be attempted by those trained and familiar with the technique of tracheal intubation. This will most frequently be the anaesthetist and the importance of calling early for help and advice from an anaesthetist in these patients cannot be overemphasised enough. Preparing your kit for intubation. Meticulous attention to detail is needed when preparing for intubation to avoid mishaps and potentially life-threatening consequences of aspiration and hypoxia. Equipment required for intubation includes an appropriately sized endotracheal tube, a tie to secure it, a laryngoscope with alternative blade size available, and equipment on standby should intubation prove difficult. This includes a gum elastic bougie and alternative means of ventilating, e.g. a laryngeal mask airway. Connecting to a ventilator or an ambu bag once the endotracheal tube is in place will ensure artificial ventilation for the patient. In an emergency setting where patients are not starved and are at risk of aspiration, a rapid sequence induction for tracheal intubation is performed. Anesthesia and relaxation of the vocal cords must be provided for passage of the tube into the trachea. Given the risk of aspiration in a population presenting with a reduced conscious level, a rapid sequence induction provides these optimal conditions in the larynx with fast onset. Preparation is vital for rapid sequence induction. Predetermined doses of drugs are prepared beforehand. The tilting capacity of the trolley should be checked, with suction available under the pillow in the event of aspiration. The patient is pre-oxygenated with a tight-fitting mask for at least three minutes. Before loss of consciousness, cricoid pressure is applied. Cricoid pressure is pressure with the thumb and index finger over the cricoid cartilage, used since it forms the only complete ring of the larynx and the trachea. Pressure over this cartilage displaces the larynx backwards, compressing the esophagus between the cricoid cartilage and the vertebrae behind. This prevents passive regurgitation of gastric contents during induction of anaesthesia. So now on to describe the conduct of rapid sequence induction. Predetermined doses of induction agent and neuromuscular blocker are given to relax the vocal cords and provide anaesthesia rapidly. The combination of thiopentone and succinothonium are most commonly described in the classical rapid sequence induction. Then rapid onset of action negates the need to provide face mask ventilation whilst waiting for their onset, thereby avoiding insufflating the stomach with ventilation and potential aspiration of its contents. The choice and doses of drugs used will depend on both the hemodynamic characteristics of the patient and the experience of the doctor. In addition, vasopressors should be readily available in the event of hypotension following induction. After successful intubation with connection of the tracheal tube to a ventilating device, checks must be carried out to confirm correct placement of the tube in the trachea. These include auscultation of both lung fields, observing for chest movement, and observing for fogging of the tube as warm, humidified air is expired from the lungs. A square-shaped waveform seen on capnography confirms the presence of N-tidal carbon dioxide. A series of square-shaped waveforms seen on capnography remains the gold standard for ruling out esophageal intubation. Only when you are satisfied with the correct placement of the endotracheal tube should you ask your assistant to release the cricoid pressure. Failure to identify an endotracheal tube misplaced in the esophagus will lead to life-threatening hypoxia. If in doubt, take it out and provide bag valve mask ventilation before attempting laryngoscopy again. So, in summary, be aware of features of airway compromise and identify and treat patients with airway obstruction early. Call for help from an anaesthetist and anticipate deterioration in patients with air airway compromise. Use of simple airway manoeuvres with basic adjuncts will often achieve a patent airway. Remember, oxygenation is paramount. Make every attempt to provide high oxygen concentration to your patient 
in whom airway compromise is suspected. Call for help early and prepare for intubation in a timely fashion. Recognise the dangerous sequelae of hypoxia and aspiration. Expert help from an anaesthetist will help reduce these risks. And finally, practice in a simulation centre and in theatre with an anaesthetist. This will improve your skills in recognising, managing and treating these patients. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you have any questions, comments or a topic you'd like to suggest for future, please visit www.ucl.ac.uk forward slash anaesthesia.